obesity. Okay? It's chewing through our healthcare dollars like nothing ever before. But you know, obesity is not new. It's been around a long time. This is a statue, it's an 11 inch statue called the Venus von Willendorf. It carbon dates back to 22,000 BC. It was unearthed in Austria in 1908, and it sits in a German museum today. And what it shows us is that the ancients knew about obesity before they knew about McDonald's. Okay. Obesity is part of the human condition. There are about 60 different medical causes of obesity, but that, none of those explain what's happened in the last 25, 30 years. How did we get so obese so fast? People talk about obesity being the interaction between genetics and our environment, like Congressman Forrest said. Well, you know what? Our genetics haven't changed, but our environment sure has. And the question is, what happened? How did it happen? And how do we turn it around? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And in the process of talking about that, I hope I will have debunked the last 30 years of nutrition information and policy in America. And when I'm done, I hope you'll tell me whether or not I was successful. All right, so with that, let's go. This was 10 years ago, the cover of Newsweek. In fact, things have gotten worse since then, not better. With all of the attention that has been uh, focused on childhood obesity and adult obesity for that matter, and all of the issues surrounding it, and with all of the metabolic syndrome, everybody know what that is? The cluster of diseases, type 2 diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. Going through the roof, no one's been able to do anything about it. Things just continue to get worse, and not just here in America, but worldwide. And I will show you that data too. Now, everybody is a dietitian. And the reason is because you all think you understand obesity. And you all think you understand obesity because you think you understand this first law of thermodynamics, which states that the total energy inside a closed system remains constant. Now, I believe in the first law. The first law is a law of physics. It is elegant. Okay? If, you thought, if I didn't believe in the first law, you'd declare me a whack job and have me out of here on a rail so fast and make your head spin. Okay? The first law is correct, okay? but like any law, it's subject to interpretation, correct? Right? The Supreme Court, that's why there's a Supreme Court for interpretation of the law, okay? two interpretations. So here's the first interpretation. This is the interpretation you learned in school and since uh, on TV, etc. Here it is, ready? If you eat it, you better burn it or you're going to store it. Now, who here believes that? Come on, all raise your hand. Come on, you all believe it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. All right? I used to believe it. I was taught this too. This is what's wrong. This is the mistake. And as long as we believe this, we're never going to solve obesity. Because if you believe this, then obesity is the result of two aberrant behaviors. Gluttony here, right? And sloth. This is secondary. So if you eat more than you burn, you're going to gain weight. If you eat less than you burn, you're going to lose weight. That's what everyone tells you. That's what all of the pundits, the experts, the dietitians, the uh, websites, etc., all tell you that's what it's all about. Eat less, exercise more. Garbage. Doesn't work. And I'll show you, it doesn't work. Okay? But this is, this is the law, and this is the interpretation. And this all comes about because of this dogma right here. A calorie is a calorie. That it doesn't matter where the calories come from. It could come from fruits and vegetables. It can come from soft drinks. It can come from cheesecake. It can come from anywhere. And the physical activity side of it, you can sleep it off. You can walk it off. You can vigorous, vigorous activity it off. And it's all about the balance. That's what this dogma says. So from that dogma come the following corollaries. That you have a choice of what you put in your mouth, therefore this is free will. You choose to be obese. Personal responsibility, it's your fault. And if it is your fault, then guess what? The insurance companies and the federal government don't have to pay for obesity services, which they don't. Gluttony and sloth, and therefore diet and exercise. That's where we are today. And that's why we're in this boat today, 
because that's what everyone in this room believes today. Well, I'm going to shatter that for you right now. Okay. So is this just another is caloric bacchanalia? Oh, wait, this is not right. Hold on. That's better. Okay. Indeed, we are eating more. I'm not arguing that. Men, adult men, 187 calories a day extra over the last 25 years. Women, 335 calories a day. Teen boys, 275 calories a day every single day. Yes, we are eating more, no arguments. So you say, well, there's your obesity epidemic right there. No, no, not so fast. Way more than that. Okay? The evolution of fast food. You all know this. All you have to do is go to your local Hardee's and check out the thick burger over here, right? 1,420 calories. And Carl's Jr., they got a 2,000 calorie $6 burger right? in the midst of this obesity epidemic. And they are proud of it, too. And they told us so, that they were proud of it. So here's the original White Castle hamburger, 210 calories. Bob's Big Boy over here at 618. And this is the thick burger. OK. So you say, well, there you go. That's the obesity epidemic right there. Or is it just an activity famine? On this side, over here, we have a measure of physical activity. And over here, we have ages 9 to 19. And this is white girls and black girls right here. And you'll notice, by age 15, the black girl's lying prostrate on the floor. She didn't even move. So you say, well, there you go. There's your obesity epidemic. We eat more. We exercise less. QED, end of discussion. And guess what? We're done. And we're done for. Because this isn't going to solve anything. We've known that for 25 years, and it hasn't solved anything. And it's not going to solve anything. We have to get past this. Yes, we are eating more. Yes, we are exercising less. The question is, why are we eating more? Why are we exercising less? Because Americans are gluttons and sloths? They're doing bariatric surgery at Tokyo Children's. They're beating the pants off us in math and science and everything else, and they're doing bariatric surgery at Tokyo Children's. You want to tell me that they're gluttons and sloths too? Something's up. Point is, dogma doesn't make sense. The only dogma is there is no dogma. Because whatever we believed 10 years ago is already wrong, and whatever we believe today will be wrong 10 years from now. That's what research is. Is basically overthrowing the previous dogma of the previous generation to advance progress. So whatever you learned, I'm, trying to I'm here to tell you, it's wrong. And you know what? 20 years from now, somebody will tell saying, I was wrong too, but that's okay because I'm here now. All right? Mark Twain said, education consists of mainly of what we have unlearned. So I'm going to unlearn you right now. Okay? So behavior, personal responsibility. Is that what this is about? There are, whoops, sorry. There are five reasons to doubt this formulation. And you know what they are. And you've, they probably you know, entered your mind over the course of the past couple of years, and you've basically discounted them. But I'm here to bring them back up. First. No child chooses to be obese. The quality of life of an obese child is the same as a child on cancer chemotherapy. You think they go out and say, I think I'll go ahead and be obese today? You think a two-year-old says, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to go ahead and eat all this crap because I want to be obese? You know, no one chooses to be obese. Oh, maybe, you know, you say, I know somebody who wants to be obese. You know, the um, uh, uh, composer Rossini, uh, composed La Gaza Ladra, Barbara Seville, you know, many Italian operas. He retired at, a, at age 37 to a life of gastronomic debauchery, and he died at age 72, weighing 325 pounds. Maybe he chose to be obese, but you know what? I didn't. Congressman Farr weighs 25 pounds more. You know what? I, 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 you know, I think we both have to you know, join the 12-step program, right? <laughs> okay. We all do. We all weigh 25 pounds more, okay? and we didn't choose it. It happened to us. Okay, number one. Number two, does diet and exercise work? Everyone says, well, I know somebody who dieted and they lost all this weight. You know what? They gained it all back, didn't they? Okay? The number of people who have lost weight and kept it off is exceedingly, vanishingly small. And that's shown right here. So you lose weight initially and then it all comes back right here. And the number of people who can maintain their weight loss for one, two, four years, nine years, unbelievably small. There is a registry called the National Weight Loss Registry. It's an online registry. Anyone in this room can sign up for it if you've lost 30 pounds and kept it off for more than one year. And it's maintained by the University of Colorado. And you can go online, National Weight Loss Registry, and you can enter all your data, and they actually analyze it. And there are 6,000 people who have put their data in. 
But you know what? There are 80 million people who are obese in this country who haven't put their data in because they couldn't, because they can't. Right? So the number of people who've actually been successful is exceedingly small. Number uh, oh, then we're looking at childhood obesity now for treatments. Notice, this is the identity line here. Conclusions, limited evidence support the short-term efficacy of medications and lifestyle interventions. The long-term efficacy and safety of pediatric obesity treatments remain unclear. Here's exercise. When compared with no treatment, exercise resulted in small weight loss across studies. One kilo. I ain't going to do it. Vigorous exercise, one and a half kilos. I ain't going to do it. The fact of the matter is, they don't work. A lot of people will tell you if they exercise, they gain weight. And think about it. I mean, you know, 20 minutes of jogging is one chocolate chip cookie. You can't do it. No one can. And there's not one piece of data anywhere in the literature that says that exercise promotes weight loss. Yet, when you go to the doctor, they say, well, if you just ate less and exercised more, and you say, but I did, and they say, well, you're non-compliant. That's the answer. Okay? And that's what the insurance company says, too. That's the answer. Why? Because they don't want to pay for it. That's why. Okay? And this is just pediatric interventions for um, uh, uh, prevention of obesity. No significant effect on BMI compared with control. Bottom line. They don't work. Number three, this isn't just America. This isn't just the UK. This isn't just Australia. Yeah, we're the three most obese nations, but you know what? It's everywhere. It's the entire Pacific Rim. It's basically every country that's adopted our diet now has this problem. I just had three Chinese pediatricians from Nanjing, China, come visit me for a month and spend time in our clinic to see how we take care of obesity because their epidemic is enormous. Every single country has doubled their incidence of childhood obesity in the last 10 years. France, Germany, China, Japan, Korea, all of them. Are they all gluttons and sloths? Every one of these kids? Get with it. Number four, the poor are disproportionately affected. Now, they have very specific obstacles. Number one, food deserts. They can't even get healthy food, right? Number two, they can't let their kids out of the house for fear of crime. They don't have access to healthy choices. Well, if you don't have access to healthy choices, that means you don't have a choice. And if you don't have a choice, how can it be personal responsibility? Personal responsibility infers that you chose to do the wrong thing because you had a choice. But if you don't have a choice, it ain't personal responsibility. Number five, we even have an epidemic of obese six-month-olds. Now, they don't diet and exercise. So any hypothesis that you want to proffer to me about what's causing the obesity epidemic has to explain this as well, and you can't. Because gluttony and sloth, diet and exercise, calories in, calories out, doesn't work. It never did, and it never will. It's wrong. So you say, how can that be? How can it be? The first law of thermodynamics is right, because there's another interpretation, and we're going to get there. Okay, I'm going to show you. This all focuses on what we mean by the concept of behavior. Because, after all, you'd say that gluttony and sloth, those are two behaviors, two aberrant behaviors. Well, what is a behavior? Here's the definition right here. A stereotyped motor responds to a physiological stimulus. So let's take that apart. Stereotype, same every time. So eating's a behavior, because it looks the same every time you do it. Yeah, okay, that's a behavior. Motor, muscles have to move, a thought is not a behavior. And finally, physiological. Physiological. Every behavior has a physiological basis behind it. When you go to the faucet to grab a glass of water, that's a behavior, but it was driven by your sodium concentration and your volume concentration in your blood. Okay? Schizophrenia for 100 years was considered a behavioral disorder. We now know it's a defect in dopamine neurotransmission. Point is, there is biochemistry behind every behavior. Behavior has a biochemical basis. All behaviors do. We may not be smart enough to figure out what they are, but there's biochemistry behind it. Now, when we talk about behavior in this room, what we're talking about is the cognitive inhibition on that biochemical process. You think you can exert that kind of cognitive inhibition on that biochemical process 24-7, 365? 
that biochemistry is going to win out eventually. And that's the recidivism of obesity because no one can do it. You can't exert enough inhibition on biochemistry to solve this problem. No one can. And that's what we see. And that's why we've got this problem, because it ain't so. So what I'm interested in, and what I've spent the last 15 years researching, is what are the biochemical underpinnings of gluttony and sloth? What makes you do that? What makes anybody do that? How do you turn anybody into an obese person. Because we have a hormone that comes from our, our fat cells and goes to our brain called leptin. Anybody heard of that? Leptin, L-E-P-T-I-N, okay? This is a hormone that tells your brain you've had enough, that you can engage in normal, expensive metabolic processes. When it goes down, your brain sees starvation. And what do you think happens when you're starved? You get gluttonous and slothy. So what obesity is about is why leptin isn't working. What happened to make leptin not work over the past 25 years? Because when we solve that, then we'll have solved obesity. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Nonetheless, Kelly Brownell, who is at Yale University, the head of the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity, published this book called Food Fight, in which he coined this term here, the toxic environment. And I'm here to tell you it's more toxic than you know. But he was talking about modern eating and exercise conditions over here on the food side. Available as tw 24 hours a day, right? You can get food anywhere. Accessible as never before. Sold in places unrelated to eating. Who ever heard of having dinner at a gas station? <laughs> but you did, didn't you? I know you did. <laughs> really cheap, right? Promoted heavily, especially to children, and designed to taste really good, and we'll talk about that too, to keep people eating. On the activity side, decreased walking and biking. Okay? In 1974, 66% of kids walked or biked to school. Today, it's 10%. Little PE. In San Francisco, 80% of the fifth graders cannot pass the SFUSD phys ed exam. And the reason is because there are no phys ed teachers, because they've got to get their own phys ed certificate. They've got to pay for it themselves. So no one has it, so there's no teachers. So there's no phys ed. And so the kids can't pass it. Screen time makes kids inactive. Everybody knows about that, and that's been ballyhooed a lot. And finally, again, parents are reluctant to let their kids out of the house for fear of crime. So you all know about those. Okay? That's what Brownell was talking about. He's talking about these as a euphemism for our altered behaviors, putting it under one rubric, the toxic environment. I'm here to tell you it's way worse than that. Because I think there's something actually insidious and poisonous going on, really toxic actually biochemically toxic that's killing us, okay? And that's what chronic disease is, is the manifestation of this toxic reaction in our bodies. And obesity is a marker for it. Could exposure to environmental toxins in our environment actually promote weight gain? And the answer is, a lot of people think so. There have been several conferences now that have looked at this question Estrogens, phthalates, which are plasticizers, the thing that makes rubber duckies uh, soft and pliable that kids put in their mouths, okay? You know that shower curtain, new shower curtain smell? That's phthalates, okay? You got it in your house right now, okay? Organochlorines, the entire state of Iowa is awash in atrazine to keep the corn supply whole. There's an entire dead zone in the Mississippi Delta way before um, uh, the D deep water horizon. Okay, where you can't shrimp or fish because nothing can live there because of the atrazine runoff from the Missouri River in Iowa, you know, from Iowa. Okay? Dioxins and PCBs, organotins, which go on the, um, in the paint on the bottom of uh, boats because it keeps barnacles from attaching to the hull. It's a fungicide. Okay? So it's in our water supply. You're drinking it right now. And ultimately, the big kahuna, something in our diet something we are now exposed to. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about. Okay? But this, these things are real, and they're very concerning. We're going to have another meeting about this in Istanbul in May uh, at the European Congress on Obesity. I'm, I'll be talking there. So let's talk about what we're, what we're eating. 275 calories a day extra in teen boys. What are they? Anybody know what they are? Are they fat? Not fat. Five grams, 45 calories. <laughs> Garbage. Wash. Nothing. Okay? In fact, if you take a look here, this is the trend in specific food intake over time. Whole milk, way down. 
Look at all the rest. Here's cheese and you know other things and what have you. Okay. Bottom line, for the fats, it's a wash. Okay. And that's what that's what the data says. It's a wash. Look at the carbohydrate. Okay. So as our percent calories from fat went down from 40 to 30 percent, anybody know why that happened? Because in 1982, the USDA, the AHA, and the AMA came out and said, we need to reduce our consumption of fat to prevent what? Heart disease, right? Everybody remember that? The low-fat craze we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay? Has it worked? Disaster. Complete and unmitigated disaster. We haven't eaten less fat. So everybody says, well, that's the reason, because we're not eating less fat. Garbage. Okay? In fact, our obesity prevalence has just gone up as the carbohydrate has gone up, because the fat hasn't changed. And we'll, I'll explain why. Here's the carbohydrate, 228 calories, 57 grams in teen boys. And what carbohydrate? Well, sugar sweetened beverages, 41% increase in soft drinks, 35% increase in fruit drinks, fruit aids, et cetera. Okay? For those of you who actually take care of obese patients, here's your formula. One can of soda a day is 150 calories, multiplied by 365 days a year. 35, divide by the magic number of 3,500 calories in a pound. If you eat or drink 3,500 calories more than you burn, you will gain one pound of fat. That's true. That's the first law. So that's worth 15 and a half pounds of fat per year. And our kids aren't drinking one sugar beverage a day. They're drinking four. Four. So you say, well, there's the obesity epidemic, right? Empty calories in the sugar-sweetened beverages. Nope. Way more complicated than that. We ain't done. So what is this stuff? Well, in America, it's this stuff. Right? High fructose corn syrup. Everybody's heard of it, right? Okay. Most demonized food additive yet. Corn refiners are so mad about the fact that this has been demonized that they've petitioned the FDA to change the uh, name to corn sugar. I don't care. I don't care. They actually called me to ask me what I thought of that. I don't care. That's not the issue. But we are consuming 63 pounds of this stuff per person per year. And this is something we never had in our food supply before. Okay? But here's what high fructose corn syrup is right here. Okay? So we have to do a little bit of biochemistry. I will make this as painless and as palatable as I can. Okay? But I've got to do it for you. Because there's, otherwise you'll just think it's just empty words. There's real science here. This is a molecule of glucose. Glucose is the energy of life. Glucose is what every organism on the face of the earth runs on, glucose. It is energy, okay? And you'll notice it's a six-membered ring right here. This over here is fructose. Fructose is a five-membered ring. Glucose is not sweet. Glucose is not sweet. You ever see anybody chug a, a can of Cairo syrup? What do you use Cairo syrup for? Pecan pies, right? It thickens up the pecan pie. But is it sweet? Eh. Nobody's got any taste for it whatsoever. Okay? Glucose is not sweet. Fructose, on the other hand, <laughs> okay? that's what it's all about. Okay? Now, over here we have sucrose. That's table sugar, cane sugar, beet sugar, the sugar you put in your coffee, the white stuff. Okay? Notice, one glucose, one fructose. They're the same. Because this Ether bond here gets cleaved in about a nanosecond in your intestine. And then basically they're all the same. So high fructose corn syrup, either 42 or 55% fructose, sucrose 50% fructose. It's a wash. It doesn't matter. Okay? And the corn refiners have made a big deal about it. And they've funded studies to show high fructose corn syrup no different from sugar. They're right. It's true. It is no different from sugar. They're both equally bad. They're both poison, and I'm going to show you how. Okay, I said it, poison. I meant it. I'll show you how. Okay. Congressman Farr introduced this slide even before I had a chance to show it. Coca-Cola conspiracy. Anybody here work for Coke? Pepsi? Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So here's the original standardized bottle of Coca-Cola out of Atlanta, 1915. Okay, six and a half ounces. Now, presuming that the formula hasn't changed over time, and we don't know that because only two people in the world know the formula and they're not allowed to fly the plane at the same time, you know, God forbid, okay? Um, one of those a day would be worth eight pounds of fat per year. 
1955, when sugar became plentiful again after World War II, we got up to 10 ounces. This was uh, in vending machines. You probably remember this one. Anybody remember this one, by the way? Okay, some of you remember that one, right? Okay. Okay, then, of course, in 1960, we have the ever ubiquitous 12 ounce can. That's worth 16 pounds of fat per year. And currently, today, this is the single unit of measure, right? Anybody know how many servings are in that 20 ounce bottle? Two and a half, eight ounce servings. It says so right on the bottle. Anybody know anybody who gets two and a half, eight ounce servings out of that? That's a single serving, right? You can't even buy one of these anymore out of a vending machine. They're all 20 ounces, right? And then, of course, over here we have the 7-Eleven, Big K, Thirst Buster, Big Gulp, whatever you want to call it, 44 ounces. That's worth 57 pounds of fat per year. And my colleague, Dr. Dan Hale at the University of Texas San Antonio, tells me that down there they got a Texas-sized Big Gulp. 60 ounces of Coca-Cola, a Snickers bar, and a bag of Doritos, all for 99 cents. That would be worth 112 pounds of fat per year. So you say, well, there's your obesity epidemic right there. No, 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 not so fast. Okay, got more to go. Okay, yes, those are the reasons for the increased intake. The question is, what's it doing to us? And how does it work? And why isn't leptin working? Okay, those are the questions we still have to answer. Okay, the 10 most obese states. Notice Texas isn't on there, I was surprised. <laughs> But here they are, 10 most obese states, 2010, okay? The 10 laziest states. I was, what, what do you think is going on in Nevada? I guess, you know, there's only so much you can get, exercise you can get out of this. <laughs> but do you notice anything about these two maps of the country? They're very similar, okay? Now here's the adult diabetes rate, okay? Notice anything? And finally, here's soda per capita. Notice anything? Okay, now this is correlation, not causation. You could say, well, fat diabetics who are lazy drink soda, or you could say soda causes both obesity, sloth, and diabetes. Which direction does it go? We don't know, you can't tell from this. Okay, but this is interesting. Yes? A little? Okay, good, all right. But you know what? It's not just America. So here's world sugar consumption from 1960 up to 2006, tripling world sugar consumption. And here's per capita consumption for various countries. Brazil, number one here, has the highest increase in the rate of prevalence of type 2 diabetes. It doesn't have the highest prevalence, but it has the highest rate of increase over time. And it's the biggest sugar consumer. And look, I mean, Malaysia, they consume enormous amounts of sugar. I gave a talk in Kuala Lumpur, and they were just shocked showing the data. So here's the prevalence of diabetes, 2010. Pretty amazing, okay? So here's our secular trend in fructose consumption over time. Our ancestors, 100 years ago, getting fruits and vegetables and honey, that was the other source of fructose, out of the ground or out of a beehive, you know. I mean, bottom line, nature made fructose hard to get. Man made it easy to get, okay? Because, you know, fruits and vegetables, you had a harvest, you know, came with fiber, you know, it was not so much. We're gonna talk about fiber in a minute, okay? And, you know, beehives were guarded by bees. So nature made fructose hard to get, man made it easy to get. And here's what happened. So natural consumption of fructose from fruits and vegetables, about 15 grams a day. Prior to World War II, with the advent of the candy industry and the soda industry, the nascent soda industry, we got up to about 20 grams a day. By 1977, just before the advent of high fructose corn syrup in this country, we were up to 37 grams a day, or 8% of our total caloric intake. By 1994, we were up to 55 grams a day, or 10% of our total caloric intake. And currently, adolescents are about 75 grams a day. Mean, average, average. And some of them are consuming 100 grams of fructose a day. This would be 12%. So not only are we consuming more, yes, we are. Not only are we consuming more fructose, yes, we are, but we're consuming more fructose as a percent of our total caloric intake. And the question is, what does that do to you? Can you do it? The media, I'm going to show you, the median consumption of sugar, sugar, for America right now is 22 teaspoons a day. Mexican Coke is just as bad as American Coke. Doesn't matter, okay? Here's the point. Here's the Center for Science and the Public Interest, and here's the Corn Refiners Association, and they did this together. They wrote this together. Three years ago, when Gavin Newsom, before he decided to be lieutenant governor, he was actually trying to float a soda tax for the first person to float one. 
Okay? And they came down on him something awful. Here's what they said. We respectfully urge that the proposal be revised as soon as possible to reflect the scientific evidence that demonstrates no material differences in the health effects of high fructose corn syrup and sugar. I agree. Here's the important statement. The real issue is that excessive consumption of any sugars may lead to health problems. I also agree. They said it. They said it. I didn't. They said it. They know. They know. How do we come to here? Where did this come from? So this is the perfect storm, if you will, from three political winds that basically generated what is tantamount to uh, the American tsunami. Okay? Because it's going to kill more people than Japan did, okay? by far and away. Here's the first. Johnson's war on poverty was picked up by Nixon in 1973, and he knew that food, altering food prices fomented political unrest. He knew that. And he told his secretary, Earl Butts, uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Butts, that food should be taken off the, pres the table for presidential elections. Indeed, that is correct, because here we have, this just came from Time Magazine three weeks ago, the percent of gross national product spent on food by country. Here's US at 7%, we're the lowest. Here's the UK at 9%, here's Australia at 11%. We are the three most obese countries because our percent GDP spent on food is the lowest. True. But take a look at this because look at the countries in purple. They're all in revolution now. Food, altering food prices alters political unrest. And Nixon knew that. Everybody remember three years ago, we tried sending the corn to make ethanol instead of high fructose corn syrup? That caused rice riots in Thailand and they overthrew their government. So changing food prices has a political cost. And Nixon knew that. And so the goal was make food cheap. Indeed, we have, 7%. Second, the advent of high fructose corn syrup. Invented in 1966 at Saga Medical School in Japan by Takasaki. Introduced to the American market in 1975. It took 10 years for the, the uh, transition from sugar in soda to high fructose corn syrup to be complete. Everybody remember New Coke, 1985? That was the complete and final transition to a high fructose corn syrup based um, uh, sh uh, uh, soda. And indeed, Bringing that into the American marketplace changed everything. Because here's the US producer price index for sugar going up, down, up, down, okay, between 1970 and 75. Now here's the advent of corn sweeteners. And look, it all stabilizes out because now there's competition. And on the international stage, here's the London price of sugar doing the same thing. Obviously, you know, they pay more than we do. And finally, the US retail price, you can see sugar versus high fructose corn syrup, it's half as expensive. It's cheap. It's cheap. And because it's cheap, it found its way into everything. Why do pretzels have high fructose corn syrup? Why do hamburger buns have high fructose corn syrup? Why does hamburger meat have high fructose corn syrup? Why do any of these things have high fructose corn syrup? Why? Because they know when they add it, you buy more. That's what they know. And indeed, they have learned that, and they keep doing it, and they keep adding more and more. Why? Why? Well, there are a couple of reasons. First reason, and I'll talk about the biochemistry in a minute, but there's one obvious reason. There are four tastes. Anybody know what they are? Sweet, sour, what else? Bitter, good, one more. Salty. Those are the four, okay? Sugar covers up the other three. Covers up sour. Yogurt. Yogurt is sour except in America, where yogurt is a dessert, okay? How about bitter? Caffeine is bitter, okay? But milk chocolate is sweet. How about salty? Kettle corn, Chex Mix, sweet and sour pork, right? You add enough sugar, you can make dog poop taste good. <laughs> and indeed, they have. That's what they're, and that's what your kids are eating, okay? They're eating sugar-flavored dog poop. There's not a whole lot of difference, okay? Everybody got it? Okay, we're gonna talk about the bio, that's, so that's here, but we're gonna talk about the biochemistry next. So here's 
the advent of high fructose corn syrup here going up. Here's sugar coming down. And so the corn refiners say, well, it's just been a substitution. You know, because the stuff's cheaper, we added it, you know, so we're just making a switch. That's all, okay? But not really, because you see here's 73 pounds per year. Here's 95 pounds per year up here. And there's something missing from this diagram. Anybody know what it is? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Juice. Juice is sucrose. Juice is table sugar, right? Okay? And this just shows uh, work from uh, inner city Harlem that juice servings per day correlates with change in BMI Z score per month in inner city Harlem toddlers. Okay? So juice makes kids fat. Yet, the American Academy of Pediatrics still says juice is okay, and it's still on the WIC portfolio. Now, to WIC's credit, they are, they've added fruit, but they haven't taken away juice. So that's a big issue. Okay? And you guys in this room know this. So now we've added juice here, and now we're up to most fructose items here. And bottom line, we're consuming 156 pounds of sugar per year. Seven ounces a day for every man, woman, and child in America. That's where we are. The question is, what does that do to you? Okay. So the last political storm that created this. Remember I told you in 1982, the USDA, the AHA, and the AMA all said, eat less fat. Now why'd they tell us that? Where'd that come from? So in the 1970s, we learned about this thing called LDL. Anybody heard of LDL? Low-density lipoprotein. Good for you or bad for you? Not really. Not really. We're going to talk about that. Mid-1970s, we learned that dietary fat raised your LDL. That's true. It does. So if dietary fat's A and LDL's B, we learned that A led to B. In the late 1970s, we learned that LDL correlated with cardiovascular disease. The higher your LDL, the more chance for cardiovascular disease because there's this genetic disease called familial hypercholesterolemia where your LDL is through the roof and you get a heart attack when you're 18. So we all learned that LDL was correlated with cardiovascular disease. So B correlated with C. So if A leads to B and B is correlated with C, we thought, well, gee, then A must lead to C, therefore no A, no C. Take the dietary fat out, heart disease will go away. Did it work? No. Of course not. Why? Anybody see the problem with the logic here? Anybody? So A leads to B, B leads to C. Well, yeah, but A could lead to B, B could lead to D, E, F, G, H, and I, never come back to C. Or, and also, the contrapositive of a statement is not, it's not no A, no C, it's no C, no A. So the logic isn't even right. And of course, it wasn't tested. All right, now, here is what happened in the 1970s. Two books. This one was called Pure, White, and Deadly, written by a British physiologist nutrition by the name of John Yudkin. Yudkin was as decorated a physician and scientist as you can imagine until this book came out. And then he was rowed out on a rail by Tate and Lyle, who owns the sugar industry in Britain. Okay? Over here we have the seven country study by a guy by the name of Ansel Keys. Anybody heard of him? front cover of Time magazine, Minnesota epidemiologist who was interested in the cause of cardiovascular disease, and he was the one who said saturated fat was the bad guy. Okay? You owe it all to Ansel Keys. That was his contribution. Well, here's the data, seven country study. Here we go, US, Canada, Australia, England and Wales, Italy, Japan. Percent calories from fat, cardiovascular disease. So you say, ah, perfect, makes sense. Let's get rid of dietary fat. Let's get rid of saturated fat. Anybody see anything wrong with this? What's, what's going on here? Italy and Japan? How much sugar they got? The Japanese didn't even know what sugar was till we brought it to them after World War II. Do you ever taste a Japanese dessert? Sucks. Okay? Italy, you know? After the gelato, you know, which the Americans eat when they're over there, you know, they don't eat that stuff. It's all fruits and vegetables. The Mediterranean diet, very healthy diet, absolutely. Because Italians didn't have a sugar island. The Brits had Barbados. We had Cuba. The French had Guadeloupe and Martinique, which they bought off um, uh, England uh, in exchange for Canada. Okay, you remember Voltaire said, what is Canada but a few acres of snow? Because they wanted the sugar islands. Okay? But Italy never had a sugar island, so there's no sugar in the Italian diet. So, 
Look at that. Not only is their dietary fat low, but their sugar's low too. So look at this. This comes from Keyes' own work, page 262. The fact that the incidence of coronary heart disease was significantly correlated with the average percentage of calories from sucrose, sucrose, sugar, is explained by the intercorrelation of sucrose with saturated fat. They went together. In other words, donuts. <laughs> Partial correlation analysis shows that with saturated fat constant, there's no significant correlation between dietary sucrose and the incidence of cardiac disease. When you do a multivariate linear regression analysis like Keyes did, you have to do it both ways. So you hold fat constant and show sugar doesn't work, and then you have to hold sugar constant and show that fat still works. You see that here? He didn't do it. He didn't do it. I don't know why he didn't do it. He's dead. I can't ask him. But the bottom line is he didn't do it. And the question is, we based 30 years of nutrition information and policy in this country on this study in 1982. And as far as I'm concerned, it has a hole in it as wide as the USS Cole. But this is where we are today. This is what happened. And it's been fostered along by our own nutrition policy. And to this day, we haven't fixed it. So when you make a mistake, what do you do? You admit the mistake and you right the ship. We haven't admitted the mistake and we haven't righted the ship. Also, Remember I told you LDL may be not so bad? Reason? There are two LDLs, not one, there are two. Here's one, it's called large buoyant over here, pattern A. Here's another one called small dense, pattern B. Turns out pattern B is the bad guy. Pattern A is not a bad guy. Because pattern A floats, these are large buoyant. They don't get stuck under the surface of the endothelial cell in the blood vessels to start the foam cell process, which starts the atherosclerosis. Pattern A is irrelevant, it's neutral. Pattern B is the bad guy. Dietary fat raises pattern A, no argument. Okay? Here's pattern A. The way you can tell if, they're, if you're large buoyant than pattern A is you look at your triglycerides. If your triglycerides are low and your HDL is high, you got pattern A. Don't worry. On the other hand, if it's the other way around and your triglycerides are high and your HDL is low, then you got pattern B. Worry a lot. So that's how you can tell on your own lipid profile whether you got a problem or not. Check your triglycerides and your HDL. A ratio of 2.8 or greater, good luck. So what makes pattern B go up? Carbohydrate. And what are we eating more of? Carbohydrate. And what do we got more of? Cardiovascular disease. This is a problem. We're not solving it. So in 1982, with the advent of this change in our diet, we got Entenmann's fat-free cakes. <laughs> we got snack wells, right? Because the low content of low-fat home-cooked food, you can control it. You can do what you want with it at home, right? But low-fat processed food, when you take the fat out, that's where the flavor was. It tastes like cardboard. Food industry knows that. So what happens? They've got to do something to make it palatable, palatable. So what they do? They added the sugar. So here's snack wells. Two grams of fat out, 13 grams of carbohydrate in, four of which were sugar. Now, is this a good thing? Entenmann's fat-free cakes gave my father a heart attack. Maybe yours, too. So as far as I'm concerned, we've had our food supply adulterated under our noses with our tacit approval because it tastes good. Addition of fructose for palatability, especially with the decreasing fat in our diet, except that it's not really decreased, it's just that the percent's decreased, and also ostensibly as a browning agent, right? Bananas brown, that's the Maillard reaction. That's binding of sugars to proteins in the fruit itself. Okay? Well, that's happening in your arteries. And the higher the fructose, the faster it happens. More cardiovascular disease. And the removal of fiber for shelf life and for freezing. Because you can't freeze fiber. Prove it to you. Go home, take an orange, put it in your freezer, leave it overnight, take it out next day, thaw it, try to eat it, see what you get. What do you get? You get a what? Mush. You get mush. Why do you get mush? Because the ice crystals f that form inside the cell wall macerate the cell wall and let all the water rush in when it thaws. You wouldn't eat that. Of course, food industry knows that too. So they take the fiber out before they freeze. Reduces depreciation. Makes food cheap. Makes food cheap. Okay, Works for them. The question is, does it work for us? And finally, substitution of trans fats. Why'd they add trans fats? Because the bacteria can't digest it. Well, guess what? Neither can we. 
because our mitochondria, which I'll talk about in a minute, the little uh, energy burning factories inside our cells, are refurbished mitochondria, uh, refurbished bacteria. They can't do it. So they build up and they cause fatty liver and they precipitate in cell walls and they cause heart disease and liver disease. And we know that too. The point of this is that fructose is not glucose. Glucose is the energy of life. Glucose is in what's in bread, rice, pasta, potatoes. Fructose is what's in everything sweet, not the same. Fructose is seven times more likely to bind to proteins and cause that reaction, the browning reaction, and that happens in your arteries. It does not suppress the hunger hormone from your tummy, ghrelin, which goes to your brain and tells you you're hungry. So if you take a kid and you let them loose at the fast food restaurant, you, you preload them with a soda, and then you send them off to buy whatever he wants at the fast food restaurant, does he eat more or does he eat less because he had the soda first? He eats more, more. Okay? Fructose does not stimulate insulin. Therefore, you don't stimulate leptin. And if you don't stimulate leptin, your brain thinks you're leptin deficient. Therefore, you're hungry and you eat more. And finally, liver fructose metabolism is completely different. And I'm going to try to make this painless for you. Bottom line, chronic fructose exposure alone causes those that triad of uh, pentad of diseases I talked about before called the metabolic syndrome. And I'll try to show it to you really, really fast. Okay? But I've got to do it because otherwise you'll think I'm just talking out of my you know where. Let's consume 120 calories in glucose. Two slices of white bread, quarter cup of rice. Everybody got it? Okay? Here's what happens to that 120 calories. 80% of them, 96 of the 120, will be metabolized by all the organs in the body because every organ in the body can metabolize glucose because every organ has a glucose transporter. So 20% or 24 calories hit the liver. Okay? And what we're going to do is I'm not going to go through all the biochemistry. That's not the point of this. Okay? All I want to point out is that the, almost the, the majority of those 24 calories end up here. Glycogen. Glycogen. Liver starch. Liver starch is good. That's what marathoners do when they carb load. They're trying to make extra glycogen. Okay? Now, is glycogen bad for you? No. Does it hurt your liver if you store extra? No. We have kids with disorders of glycogen storage. They're sick, but they don't get liver failure because glycogen is a non-toxic storage form of glucose in the liver. That's what your body wants to do with energy. It wants to make glycogen. Glycogen is good. Glucose makes glycogen. Therefore, glucose is good. I mean, you can overdo anything, but mostly it's good. Now, let's talk about a different carbohydrate. My favorite carbohydrate, maybe yours too. It's carbohydrate, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. But you know what? Ethanol is also a toxin. It's a, two toxins in one, right? You wrap your Lamborghini around a tree. That's the brain, you know, the acute effect. And it's also a chronic toxin. You fry your liver. Two toxins in one. We regulate it. We keep it out of the hands of children because we know this is bad stuff, right? Every country in the world has an alcohol control policy. Every country. Not one says alcohol is okay to just be available as a normal commodity. Here's acute alcohol exposure. You all recognize this from college. Here's fructose exposure. Nothing because the brain doesn't utilize fructose. But let's consume 120 calories in ethanol, a shot of Maker's Mark, okay? So before it was two slices of white bread, now it's a shot of Maker's Mark. 120 calories, both of them, equicaloric, but not equimetabolic, because here's what happens. Number one, 24 calories come off the top in terms of the brain, the liver, the, uh, not the liver, the uh, brain, intestine, and the kidney, first pass effect is called. So 96 calories hitting the liver. How many with glucose? 24. How many with ethanol? 96. Four times the substrate. The liver has to work four times as hard, and there's the rub, and the liver gets sick, and here's why. The ethanol comes in. You see glycogen on there anywhere? Nope. Doesn't go to glycogen. Where does it go? It goes down here to this guy over here. That's the mitochondria. That's the energy-burning factory of your cell. And what happens is you overload this, and you end up with this stuff, and look what, what comes out of it. VLDL, that's your triglyceride, that's the bad stuff. That's the stuff that causes the heart disease. And also, it gives you a lipid droplet, it gives you liver inflammation, it gives you muscle insulin resistance, and ultimately gets shunted off to um, uh, fat cells, and there gives you your, your, your obesity. So, is alcohol good? Well, kind of, sort of. 
in small doses, but what about in big doses? Not so good, right? It's a carbohydrate, it's a nutrient, but we regulate it. Okay, why do I show you all this? All right, let's do sucrose. Let's consume 120 calories in sucrose, an eight ounce glass of orange juice. So we had two slices of white bread, shot of Maker's Mark, eight ounce glass of orange juice, all 120 calories, equicaloric, but not equimetabolic. Let me show you how. So the glucose in the sucrose, right, which is half, it's half glucose, does the same 20-80 split as before. So there's 48 calories in glucose. Here's the 12 that the liver's gonna have to deal with. But the problem is that the, the liver has to do the whole fructose bolus because only the liver can metabolize fructose. So that's 72 calories hitting the liver. How many with glucose? 24. How many with alcohol? 96. How many with sucrose? 72. Three times the substrate when you add the fructose. So the liver has to work harder, and that's not good. Here's what happens. Fructose comes in. You see glycogen on this anywhere? Now, as it turns out, you could go backwards from glycogen from here. But the point is the glucose is making the glycogen. So what happens? All of the fructose comes down here to this mitochondria, down this way, and does all of these bad things, just like alcohol did. Okay? The VLDL, the lipid droplet, the insulin resistance, the triglyceride, all that stuff. And we know that the higher your insulin goes, the less well your brain can see its leptin. Remember I told you leptin was the thing that told you to stop eating? Well, when your brain can't see leptin, what happens? You get starved. You want to eat more. Guess what? This makes your leptin not work. So it makes you want to eat more. So the first law, the first law is assuming you're keeping things constant. You're not keeping things constant. That's the point. So why is exercise important in obesity? It doesn't cause weight loss because it burns calories. I mean, I told you, 20 minutes of jogging is one chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> Forget it. It's over. Give it up. Why is exercise important? I am totally for exercise. I am absolutely for exercise. It does not cause weight loss. The scale is not the way to determine if exercise helped you. Why is exercise important in uh, obesity? Because it's the thing that makes you healthy. Because it improves muscle insulin sensitivity. It reduces stress and the hormone cortisol, which is part of what kills you. And it also makes that um, uh, the mitochondria work better, and it detoxifies the fructose. Therefore, your liver's more insulin sensitive, which is what you want to be. In other words, exercise improves your health. It improves your quality of life. It doesn't extend your life. There's not one study that shows exercise makes you live longer. Not one. But you'll live better. So exercise is absolutely essential. We recommend it and prescribe it for every patient but not because it causes weight loss. So tell your doctor he's full of it. <laughs> Number two, fiber. I talked about fiber briefly before. Why is fiber important in obesity? In our clinic, we use this mantra here. When God made the poison, he packaged it with the antidote. Wherever there's fructose in nature, there's way more fiber, except for honey, and that's guarded by bees. Okay? There's actually, if you plot fructose versus fiber on a graph, it actually correlates. Think about it, sugar cane has the most fructose of anything, right? It's sugar, right, sugar cane? It's a stick. You can't even chew the damn thing, right? So wherever there's fructose in nature, there's way more fiber, and that's on purpose. God did that on purpose. Why? Because fiber does things that help obesity. Reduces the rate of intestinal carbohydrate absorption, thereby keeping your insulin down. If you keep your insulin down, number one, you shunt less sugar to fat, and you don't get in the way of your leptin signal. It increases the speed of transit from the gut into the, to the end of the intestine so you can get your satiety signal sooner. And finally, it inhibits the absorption of free fatty acids from the, in colon, uh, from the intestine. So some of them enter the colon and get metabolized by the uh, bacteria there to short chain fatty acids, which keep insulin down. Problem is, in the process, what happens? Those bacteria also make what? Methane and hydrogen sulfide, which are, yeah. right. So in my world, it's fat or fart. <laughs> and indeed, that's actually part of, the, part of the reason why we've let the fiber go out of our diet, because it's socially, quote, unacceptable. So here's chronic ethanol exposure over here. Here's chronic fructose exposure over here, 8 out of 12. 
same diseases for the same reasons because ultimately they are the same because they don't go to glycogen and they don't, or they don't uh, fix the insulin problem. And they cause metabolic disease because they basically overload the mitochondria. Call it mitochondrial constipation, if you will. Okay? Bottom line, this stuff makes trouble. Not one meal, but long term. Point is, we used to have a little. Now we have a lot. We used to have dessert once a week. Now we have it once a meal. This is what we've done. This is what's happened. So, what's the difference? Here's a can of Coke, here's a can of beer. 150 calories each, 75 glucose, 75 fructose, 90 ethanol, 60 maltose, that's glucose too. First pass effect takes 10% off. When you do the math, number of calories hit in the liver, the same. And we just decided that the number of calories hit in the liver is what this is all about. So in America, we have beer belly. Well, guess what? Welcome to soda belly. Because that's what we all have. That's the 25 pounds right there. That's what's happened. And that's what's making us sick and it's specifically sugar. And you can't dissociate the two because it's always fructose and glucose together. So the glucose is good, but the fructose is bad. But there's no sugar that doesn't have half and half. So it's always a problem. The point is we have to reduce our consumption of the stuff in order to fix the problem. So eating fruits and vegetables is not the answer. Is it good? Sure it's good. But is it the answer? No. It will not fix the problem and it hasn't fixed the problem, and it won't fix the problem, and I don't care how much fruits and vegetables we give our kids in school, until we get the sugar out of the parents' home, ain't nothing gonna work. We know this at the American Heart Association. I am a member of the board of directors of the Bay Area AHA. Uh, two years ago, we published this scientific statement, you can see I'm on it, and we recommended reduction of sugar intake from 22 teaspoons a day which is the median for America, down to nine for males and six for females, a reduction by two-thirds to three-quarters in our added sugar consumption, added sugars. Okay? That's a lot. Okay? But that's what we think we need to do in order to fix this problem. So let me reorient you. That first law of thermodynamics we started with, here we go. Here's the way you have to think about it from now on. If you're going to store it, that is, an obligate weight gain set up by biochemical forces out of your control, for instance, leptin resistance because of the inability to see your leptin because of the fructose consumption in your diet, and you expect to burn it, in other words, normal energy expenditure for normal quality of life, because energy expenditure and quality of life are the same thing. Things that make your energy expenditure go up make you feel good, like exercise, coffee, caffeine, ephedrine is off the market. Things that reduce your energy expenditure, like hypothyroidism, starvation, make you feel lousy. So how many calories you burn and how good you feel are the same. So if you're going to store it and you expect to burn it, then you're going to have to eat it. And now the two behaviors, the gluttony and the sloth, are results of the biochemical change. And our biochemical change is a result of our environmental change. Our environment changed our biochemistry, our biochemistry changed our behavior, and our behavior is then killing us. So, can we fix our behavior? No. Can we fix our environment? With a lot of political will. With the people in this room. Yes, we can. And we should, and we need to. Now, so I've, t uh, uh, okay. Also, the question of why we love this stuff so much. Junk food addiction may be clue to obesity. Fact of the matter is, the sugar addictive, the polite public seems to know, Okay. There are now studies coming out from the National Institute of Mental Health showing that sugar is addictive because it does all the same things as drugs of dependence. Nicotine, morphine, amphetamine, cocaine, cannabis, and the one I think is the best um, uh, uh, analogy is ethanol. And it makes sense because after all, where do you get ethanol from? Fermentation of fructose. It's called wine. We do it in Napa. We do it down here. right? So the big difference between the two is that for ethanol, the yeast does the first step in metabolism, and for fructose, we do our own first step, but as soon as it hits the mitochondria, it doesn't care where it came from. It's overloaded, and it hurts you. So the criteria for addiction, binging, withdrawal, craving, and cross-sensitization with other drugs of abuse. Animal studies, at least, show that fructose does them all. Okay? So we have a problem, because what's good for the food industry is bad for us, and what's good for us 
is bad for the food industry. There's no middle ground. It's a war. And we didn't even know we were fighting. So who's winning the war? Well, here's the S&P 500, and here's the economic downturn of 2008. And here's McDonald's, Coke, and Pepsi. They're doing pretty well. Bottom line, want to make some money? Invest in a food company. Because they're all doing better than you. And why? Because they added the sugar to everything. And here are the others. General Mills, ConAgra, Hormel, Kraft, Procter & Gamble, and there's the blue lines, the S&P 500. They're all doing better. And we're happy about it. Why are we happy about it? Congressman Farr knows the answer to this one. Why are we happy about this? Because 25% of our exports are food. What do you think would happen to those exports if all of a sudden the USDA or the government came out and said, you know, all that fructose we've been adding to all the food over all these years, it really isn't so good for you. What happened when that one downer cow went from Canada to Washington State? That was the end of meat sales to Britain and South Korea for two years. What do you think would happen? It'd be a little bit of a problem. And in fact, the USDA has not endorsed or adopted any of these changes. You look at the 2010 dietary guidelines that just came out, what do they say? Eat less of everything. We already know that, and it doesn't work. And it's not going to work for all the reasons I just told you. What do we need to do? Well, here's a way of thinking about it. We have toxic substances that are not abused. These are two nutrients, iron and vitamin D. But you know what? If you take too much, you get sick, right? Okay, pseudoephedrine. Okay, it's not toxic per se, but you can turn it into crystal meth. So they put it behind the uh, the, the counter at the uh, at the drugstore. Okay, toxic substances that are not abused, or we have abused substances that are not toxic. Caffeine, that's a good one, right? Anybody trying to regulate caffeine? No. no? <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> I would die. <laughs> and nicotine. Okay, nicotine is not toxic. The problem is the tars are. Okay, and the nicotine's the way of getting you to smoke the cigarette. Okay, so that's what's abusive. Okay, but not the nicotine in of itself. Because nicotine patches are not, you know, something we have to worry about. The point is, when you have something that's toxic and abused at the same time, now you got a problem. Now you got to regulate it. Now you got to keep it out of the hands of children. Morphine, amphetamine, cocaine, cannabis, ethanol. We have laws. We have reasons for keeping this stuff out of our homes, out of our kids' school boxes. Okay? Well, I'm talking about sugar here. Educational efforts alone have not solved any other drug of dependence. Did Nancy Reagan's just say no work? It was a dismal failure. Why? Because addiction is not subject to personal responsibility. It's beyond personal responsibility, because the biochemistry doesn't allow you to fix it. Same with sugar. Successful efforts have required both individual intervention, which for lack of a better word, we call rehab, and societal intervention, which we call laws, taxation, regulation, interdiction in some cases. Bottom line, I'm telling you today that we're going to need some sort of global policy to reduce sugar consumption because there's no medicine for this. I have been over this, and every other scientist has been over the, all those metabolic pathways I showed you. There's no place to develop a drug to intervene. The only thing we can do is reduce the substrate, reduce the amount. That's all we can do. Problem is, food industry ain't playing. Why? This is their juggernaut. You saw the, the, the data. You saw the stock price. So, I'm oh, sorry. Every single public health disaster we've had in this country and around the world was first a personal responsibility issue. Syphilis was a personal responsibility issue. Cholera was a personal responsibility TB was a personal responsibility issue. AIDS was certainly a personal responsibility issue. Until Chick Coop stood up and said, you know what? Calling it a personal responsibility issue isn't making anybody better. It's a public health crisis. And to his credit, Ronald Reagan agreed and said, go get him, Chick. And he did, and we revere him for taking that stand. The bottom line is, sugar, obesity, this global health crisis we find ourselves in is not going to get fixed until we admit that this is a public health problem. And it has to be dealt with in a public health sphere. Now, Ms. Obama 
has the Let's Move campaign. And Congressman Farr talked about the School Nutrition Act. And I am not against the School Nutrition Act. And I am not against Ms. Obama. Okay? I'm not against her at all. She, however, has said that it's focus on the individual, focus on the family, and focus on the community, all necessary. The question is, is that sufficient? Necessary, but not sufficient. Because she leaves government and the food industry out. Why? Very simple. They got enough enemies. They don't need another one. Right? Right. So my question to you, your homework assignment is to think about this. Can our toxic environment be changed without governmental societal intervention, especially when there are potentially addictive substances involved? That's the question you have to go home with tonight and think about. Now, societal intervention, when we do societal intervention, it requires something we call externalities. That is, how does your behavior affect me? Because if it only affects you, who gives a flying? Okay? But when it affects me, then we get a little pissed off. We get a little motivated. Okay? If you smoke or drink or take drugs, it's bad for me. We now know about secondhand smoke, right? It's bad for me. Car accidents because you drank, bad for me. Declining housing prices because you're a drug addict next door to me, that's bad for me. Altered work productivity, I gotta do your work because you're out, bad for me. All those things make externalities, make us want to do something in a societal fashion. Okay, so what's the externalities for obesity? How does your obesity affect me? $274 million in extra in jet fuel? Eh. Discomfort on the subway? Eh. The sinking of boats due to the increased weight. Everybody remember three years ago, there was this boat that was crossing Lake Champlain from Plattsburgh, New York. It was coded for 140 humans, not 140 obese humans, and it sank. Okay? Eh. Here's why. 65 billion reduction in work productivity, 50% increase in absenteeism, 50% increase in health insurance premiums, which you are paying right now, all of you, whether you're obese or not, 150 billion in waste in healthcare resources. Congressman Farr, if we could recoup those 150 billion, would we solve the health care problem? Yes, we would. You're damn right we would. Obesity is a threat to national security. Congressman Farr brought that up before. Okay, the government, uh, sorry, the army's all over this, and ultimately, the government pays twice. They pay in the corn subsidy, and then they pay for the health care expenditures. And if you think that somehow we're not going to pay for them because somebody with a heart attack, you know, who weighs 300 pounds, shows up in the emergency room and needs TPA or their um, our arteries uh, 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 rotor rooted, okay, and they show up on your doorstep, you think we're not going to pay for it? Of course we're going to pay for it, because this is America. Okay, we're not going to do wallet biopsies at the, at the, at the front door. So do you really think that we're going to be able to save the money until we can actually solve this problem? The government pays twice. And that's why we're broke. So why is alcohol policy so relevant to this question? Here's why. Because alcohol and sugar are the same. The metabolic and the central pathways are the same. They're both legal substances that produce health harms when overused. Little danger from moderate consumption. A little is OK. It's a lot that's not. And the burden of harm falls disproportionately on lower socioeconomic status groups. And they're the ones that suffer from both alcohol and obesity. Right? OK, for the same reasons. We have a strong evidence base for what works in alcohol. We have centuries of experience, 1,500 years in alcohol control policy. The Romans had an alcohol control policy. We know what works. Diversity of approaches that work internationally and robust findings, which I will show you real quick. Here's what doesn't work. Public information campaigns do not work. Just say no didn't work. Okay? Okay? Alcohol. Designated driver is about the only thing that's even close. Government guidelines do not work. We've had government guidelines for alcohol forever. Didn't do anything. Warning labels on product packaging. Cigarettes? Give me a break. School-based education programs do not work. Didn't work for alcohol. Do not work. Won't work for sugar either. Here's an example. Menu labeling. California has menu labeling, but we already have the data. This is the New York City study. McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Comparison group in Newark, New Jersey, right across the Hudson River. Same ethnic groups, same part of the country. 
Okay, basically, control population, no menu labeling. Here's the data. 349 children, ages 1 to 17, 69% accompanied by a parent, 90% from ethnic, racial, uh, ethnic, ethnic or racial minorities. Here's the data. Among adolescents, no statistically different uh, 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 caloric consumption uh, purchased before and after labeling. 35% ate fast food six or more times per week. 57% reporting noticing the calorie labels. 9% reported considering, but 72% said taste was more important. That's the data. You think menu labeling is going to make a difference? Not a damn. Not going to make a damn bit of difference. And why? Because our brain's been hijacked, that's why. Strategies that might work. Controls on advertising and marketing, especially to children. Question is, is it okay to market to children? That's a complicated question. But is it okay? A lot of people think no. I think no, but you know, I'm a pediatrician. I'm here to protect children. Okay? Government counter-advertising campaigns, I'm going to show you one. And industry self-regulation. Here's the marketing. Everybody familiar with both of these? How about this? This is Sugar's Quick Energy Can Be the Willpower You Need to Eat Less. This was Sugar Information, Inc. This was the FTC, 1972, cease and desist against Sugar Information, Inc. Wait, the fat time of day. You're really hungry and ready to eat two of everything. Here's how sugar can help. Sugar just might be the willpower you need to curb your appetite. I love this, the birth of the cola wars. For better start in life, start cola earlier. And why we have the youngest customers in the business drink 7-Up. How early does it start? We got these. Everybody got these at home? We got these. We got this, right? Disguised as education. How about soft drinks on logos on baby bottles? Everybody happy with that? Anybody happy with that? I'm not happy with that. This was last week in a Publix in Florida. Drinks are on us. Publix is uh, rewarding uh, good gra top grades with free apple juice and soda. Students, we salute your thirst for knowledge. That was last week. Okay? You okay with that? It's a global marketing campaign. How about that? How about that? And of course, the effect is global too. It's happening everywhere. They've even infiltrated us, right? Ronald McDonald Children's Hospital. 28% of US children's hospitals have a fast food concession in their lobby. Yep, okay. The first one, Children's of Philadelphia, that was the first one, the first McDonald's. 1979, they put one in. Okay, I was just there three weeks ago. They're getting rid of it. Yep, okay, so um, this is the, this works. Did it work for you? Yeah, but you guys are primed. Okay, the question is, did it work for anybody in New York? That's the question. Okay, didn't work for the kids going to the fast food restaurant, did it? In 2007, 52 European healthcare ministers got together in Istanbul to talk about junk food marketing to children, and they all agreed that that practice had to stop. Three months later, I confronted, personally, Deborah Taylor Tate, the former head of the Federal Communications Commission at an obesity meeting in Los Angeles, and I asked her about this, and here's her response. This is a direct quote. I expect the food industry to police itself. Okay? Now, in Santa Clara, and now in San Francisco, last year, you know about the toy ban, because after all, what's, why does a kid need more coercion to go to, the, to a McDonald's or a Burger King for the toy? Right? So we voted the toy ban in San Francisco. Since then, we've been the laughing stock of Jon Stewart and everybody else. In fact, just three days ago, the state of Florida and the state of Arizona voted to ban toy bans. Okay? 
they voted to ban toy bans. So they cannot actually in, do a toy ban if they even wanted to now. Think about this. Now, yes, a preemptive strike, absolutely. Okay? Now, is this a good thing, a toy ban? Yes or no? I mean, if you want to buy the toy, buy the toy. If you want to buy the food, buy the food. The, it's not that the ban, it's, the ban's not on the toy, the ban's on putting them together. Okay? All right? So any of you out there who are against the toy ban, come up and talk with me afterward. Okay? Because I got, I got some work to do on you. Okay? Okay, what's likely to work? Pricing strategies. Controls at the point of sales. Bundling strategies. Okay, let's talk about pricing strategies. Direct price controls through monopolies. Now, we're never going to have a monopoly on anything in this country because this is America. Okay, but it does work. Taxation. Now, everyone's talking about a soda tax. Everybody's against it. Except, of course, the people who are for it. Right? But talk, and then something called differential taxation. Why does taxation work when it works? Well, it reduces the availability by effectively controlling the price of the commodity. By raising the price, you basically take it out of the hands of people who can't pay for it. It's easy and cheap for governments to enforce because it's already there. It doesn't cost anything to, induce, to institute. And evidence shows that it impacts the heaviest consumers. That's a good thing, right? Try to stop heavy smokers from smoking. But who would this affect the most? It would affect the lower SES population. So they're railing about this, but they're the ones who pay the most in health care bills. So if that we could actually prevent their health care problems, they'd actually have a few bucks in their pocket to actually eat better. And we can do differential taxation because we could subsidize, say, healthy foods, like from Santa Cruz. <laughs> How about that? Okay, could you do that? You could, if you wanted to. And it, it impacts low income populations. So here's the soda tax issue. Existing taxes on soda do not result in reduction in soda consumption or obesity rates. It's been looked at. Okay? So far, what's been done hasn't worked. Why? Because it's too small. Small taxes generate money for programs. That's what's being bandied about now. Assembly Mamaning and I were talking about this just before the uh, 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 evening started. And we talked about what's the issue? How do you do this? In order to get people to stop smoking, we had to raise the price, the, the tax on cigarettes 264%. Why? Because it's addictive, that's why. Duh! Larger taxes are required to reduce consumption. Roland Sturm from the Rand Corporation in Los Angeles actually modeled this and figured out we would have to basically charge $2 for a can of soda to see any reduction in consumption. This is a problem. The question is, is this a problem we're ready to meet? I don't know. Uh, but basically, we're going to have to do for this what we did for tobacco and ethanol. Okay, restriction on access. The iron law of alcohol policy says that reducing the availability of alcohol will reduce alcohol consumption, no ifs, ands, or buts, thereby reducing alcohol-related problems. Now, of course, you could have bathtub gin. You know, you could have black market soda, you know, and things like that. But the bottom line is, if you got rid of it, it would probably be good. Control at the point of sales. You could have age limits. You could card kids for Coke. You could do that. I mean, I don't know if we will, but you could licensing, licensing and zoning controls. How about all of these convenience stores that are set up 500 feet from a school entrance? Why are they there? Because the kids are a target. That's why. Right? So what if we said, okay, you can sell soda, but you can't sell it from 3 to 6 p.m.? So the kid can't get the soda on the way home to, from uh, school. Sugar tax, not just soda. Provide incentives for farmers markets to try to improve healthy food consumption. Restrictions, zoning convenience stores away from schools. Regulating operating hours. Carding kids for Coke if we have to. Federal policy measures. Stop marketing sugar to kids. That's the most important thing. And we could do that tomorrow if we had the gumption. Remove fructose from the FDA's grass list, generally regarded as safe. Because as long as it's on the grass list, the food industry can put any amount in any food they want to at any time, and we have nothing to say about it. Now, is that okay? And finally, the corn subsidy. Is this a good idea? Some people say the corn subsidy is not an important thing because this is such a big deal and sugar is so cheap, it wouldn't matter anyway. I don't know. That's a complicated question, but it certainly couldn't hurt. And there's no economist worth their salt that believes in food subsidies. The only ones who believe in food subsidies are the ones who work for the American government. 
because they're told to. So, what I'm telling you is we've got an addiction. Okay? We've got a sugar addiction. Educational efforts have not helped any of these. Successful efforts have required individual and societal intervention, and we're going to need to do more. How do we do more? Well, we do it, did it tonight, educating you, educating Congressman Farr, educating Assemblyman Manning as to what the issue is, what the real problem is. Okay? Let them hear from you. Okay? This is going to be a bottom-up event, not a top-down event. Okay? When, the, when votes matter, then things will happen.